Bonjour à tous. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, session on uh, James Webb Space Telescope. My name is uh, Steve Beauchanger. I'm the uh, Chief Operating Officer of uh, Euroconsult. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here to be with you today for this super exciting panel. Um, first of all, I'd like to express my warm regards to my colleague, Natalia Larea, who was supposed to be the moderator today, and unfortunately she can't be here uh, with us this morning. So I'm uh, stepping in with a deep regret and great pleasure uh, to, uh, to moderate uh, this uh, panel on a very exciting uh, program, uh, which has even be uh, become, uh, I, I could say, an iconic space program already, the James Webb Space Telescope. James Webb is certainly the most ambitious space program since the International Space Station for its complexity, its size, international dim dimension, cost, and I would say most of all for the expectation for its contributions for science. And for all of these reasons, James Webb Space Telescope is unique in many ways. So a panel on James Webb has to be special too. So we have a very special agenda today. We have only one hour, um, and we have two parts uh, for, this, um, for this session. The first part, uh, we have uh, with us a uh, leading executive of uh, key partners of the space uh, of, the, of this program, uh, and they are going to share with us how they made this program possible, how uh, it was possible to make it a reality, and obviously the challenges uh, they have faced. Then we will switch to the second part of this program with the uh, leading scientists who will share with us early results, early science results from the telescope, and they will basically explain to us why this is uh, such a valuable tool for the scientific community. So we'll start straight with the first part, uh, with our panelists. I have to say that we have an impressive lineup. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being with us this early morning. Just quickly introducing our speakers, um, starting from my left, we have Mr. Thomas Zurbuchen, uh, Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate at NASA. Then Lisa Campbell, the President of the Canadian Space Agency. Then Joseph Ashbacher, Director General of the European Space Agency. Stéphane Israel, CEO of Iron Space, and Hervé Gilibert, CTO of Iron Group. So we start the, uh, the discussion and the presentation. We start with you, Thomas. Uh, thank you again for being with us uh, this morning. So James Webb is a truly masterpiece. It took, I think, around 30 years uh, to implement end to end um, until this launch, uh, and uh, required, obviously, uh, extensive collaboration with a lot of stakeholders, national, uh, international partners, and so on. And I guess that you faced multiple challenges. Can you maybe briefly explain to the audience how this program became a reality, and what did it take to make it happen? So what's really amazing about uh, being in this program is that you're benefiting from decades of work by individuals who started thinking about this before we even started our jobs, any one of us. Uh, because for over 30 years, uh, people have been talking about it, and they have been thinking about images like the one that's up there, not because they knew how it will look, but they knew that looking at the universe in new light in this kind of high-resolution infrared, uh, the entire nature would look differently and would look uh, in ways that, frankly, we could only imagine that we could start addressing uh, questions that are otherwise only uh, kind of theoretical, kind of things that we've been thinking about, but we had never seen the universe that way. So it's that vision that drove it forward. Uh, sometimes there were obstacles that almost seemed insurmountable, but what mostly did it is three agencies, uh, you know, um, uh, 29 U.S. states, uh, 14 countries, and a number of companies, including the company that got us to space, that I will speak later, as well as Northrop Grumman, Paul Aerospace, Lockheed Martin, however they're called, many others that got us there. So it's, in many ways, it's really vision and collaboration that got us uh, to that amazing goal. Do you want to show uh, some, some of the slides? Well, I think the, uh, uh, the other thing I, I want to talk about really is that uh, a program like that is full of challenges. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I want to tell you, as we're sitting right here, we're working with three challenges. One of them we talked about yesterday, a filter reel of Mary, the medium uh, uh, kind of resolution 
uh, kind of enabling filter wheel has a little bit more friction than we like. So we, uh, we're taking a break and just making sure it works well. Uh, basically, every month we've been hit by a small micrometeorite. One of them was larger than we expected. And frankly, as we're going to launch Artemis 1, uh, we're going to have kind of using the same antennas for deep space for both uh, Web and, uh, and Artemis. And, and the reason I'm telling you about all these there are a lot of uh, obstacles and, and issues that got us there, right? Kind of to get to a place like this. Uh, what I'm showing here is the Carina Nebula. I'm sure the scientists are going to talk about this in much more detail as they can. Kind of a birthplace of new uh, solar systems in our own galaxy, kind of made out of the leftover of previous generations of of uh, uh, stars, in this case, uh, you know, imaged in the infrared. Therefore, we can see kind of chemical uh, molecules that are, are there, right? It's just, uh, it's, it's images like that that uh, are now, you know, just amazing everybody around the world. But make sure you understand that the way you get there is not because of lack of obstacles, but uh, because the team that you assemble that I talked about is manages to get through it. Uh, there's other images I could show you, uh, which is, uh, of course, uh, the Cartwheel Galaxy, again, uh, likely discussed later. Okay. If you have to maybe retain the one key challenge, what would that be, uh, the top challenge that you uh, that you face for this implementation? So it's actually kind of funny. I did that exercise and asked uh, many people what they uh, thought. I'm going to ask my colleagues here uh, what they thought the top challenge was. Uh, what, for me, personally, the top challenge was something like five years before launch, uh, we struggled uh, kind of in ways that, uh, frankly, we just made many more mistakes than we should have. It's, it, I don't know whether you've ever run a team, any one of you or been part of a team that did something really hard. Sometimes you get kind of towards the end, kind of uh, 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 a little bit of uh, uh, a crisis of belief almost, like mm -hmm. coming together. Uh, it's not that people aren't working perfectly, trying to be really there, uh, uh, alert and everything, but kind of as a team, you know, like if you watch, you know, football, as you call it on this side of the Atlantic, you know, on TV uh, in the morning, uh, you know, on Sunday or during the weekend, you know, you can have excellent athletes on the team, on the, on the field, but not a great team. Mm. And so, so basically building a great team was really what I thought was the biggest challenge. But I'm really, if you're okay with that, I'm really interested what you felt the biggest challenges yeah, yeah, were. Anyone wants to, to, to comment on this, on the biggest challenge or not? No? It was uh, maybe uh, as well a challenge and uh, a success. And a success. Challenge and success. I mean, there are, as uh, Thomas is saying, there are many challenges uh, coming up, uh, of course, uh, on the side of ESA, apart from uh, contributing on the instruments, uh, one big challenge was, of course, the launch itself. And uh, there I have to say, and I will probably say a few words afterwards on, on exactly this, uh, this event, the, the launch campaign, making sure that everything mm -hmm. is perfect, uh, climbing this high mountain. Uh, uh, Thomas comes from a mountain country, myself and some of the other participants uh, as well, uh, climbing this high mountain and uh, making sure that you reach there and uh, mm -hmm. reach there at the right moment is, is a huge challenge. And I think this moment so these weeks and months just before the launch for us was a huge uh, mm. challenge, a uh, huge mountain to climb as well. But uh, the much bigger mountain certainly has been, cl has been climbed by, by Thomas, uh, getting uh, James Webb uh, ready a couple of years before the launch, uh, four or five years, as you say, because there I realized that you have done an enormous job and shown leadership. And thank you for that and compliments for that. Yeah, and the, uh, the issue that I talked about, I uh, talked about the team, what, they, what we worked on last was really this deployment of that huge system. Mm. And the deployments, right, that all folded up like a transformer in the movies on top of the rocket that need to be deployed to the, uh, the shield, the area of a, a tennis court uh, five times over with the exact shape and, and the optics that need to be aligned. So basically, uh, when you look at the, at the image, it, it, it's just like it would be one big mirror, even though it's 18 small ones. Uh, that are or smaller ones that are, are aligned uh, together. So, so I just couldn't be more proud of the team. Kind of when I when I you know I look at an image like this, the Cardwheel Galaxy. You know, uh, of course I see the stars, I see the galaxies, I see the astrophysics, but I also see the work of the amazing team that really enabled that. Again, an international team that came together despite the obstacles, not because there were none of them.
Thank you, Thomas. We uh, move to, uh, to Lisa for, 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 the, for the CSA. So, um, Canada is a key international partner. Uh, I don't think this is the right slide, actually. This is the next one. If you can, no, this is not this slide. Yes, I think this is this one. Um, so Canada is a key international partner in the program, uh, and uh, space science and exploration is a, a, an essential pillar of the uh, Canadian space program, uh, with a lot of uh, achievements with the Canada Arm and many others. Can you elaborate on what are the key contributions on Canada for this program and what it is impactful for, for Canada? Merci beaucoup. Ça me fait tellement plaisir d'être ici. Bonjour tout le monde. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Canada is so proud to be part of the international collaboration on the James Webb Space Telescope. We've contributed two important elements to Webb, the scientific instrument and a guidance sensor. Canada's fine guidance sensor is crucial to all Webb observations. It allows the telescope to point at and focus on objects of interest with extreme precision. The FGS guides the telescope with an accuracy of one millionth of a degree. The Near Infrared Imager and Slitless Spectrograph, or NIRIS, is a scientific instrument that helps researchers study many astronomical objects, from exoplanets to distant galaxies. It's used to observe some of the earliest and most distant objects in the universe's history by obtaining key spectra of all faint objects in its field of view. It can also peer through the glare of nearby young stars to discover new exoplanets by providing very high spatial resolution and contrast. Canada's contributions played an integral part in the first scientific images and data from the telescope released this past July. And the first observations, I'll just get to the next slide. The first observations uncovered spectacular cosmic features. NIRIS found definitive evidence of water in the atmosphere of a hot gas giant exoplanet not known as WASP-96b. This exoplanet orbits a sun-like star located over a thousand light years from Earth. NIRIS's sensitive observation is the most detailed near-infrared transmission spectrum of an exoplanet atmosphere ever captured. NIRIS's observation also shows evidence for haze and clouds, which were not previously believed to exist on this planet. Canada's fine guidance sensor was also critical in producing these stunning data and images. Thanks to its ability to remain locked on to guide stars for long periods of time, especially while the telescope is in motion. Because it's used with all of Webb's instruments and throughout all observations, FGS was a crucial part of the first images that wowed the world. Remember that on July 11th? And the important scientific observations that we hope will continue for many, many years. So our contribution, uh, we feel, and we're so proud to be part of this incredible international team, opens stunning opportunities for our researchers. It's an extraordinary tool that heralds the beginning of a new era for space astronomy. Future discoveries promise to redefine our understanding of the universe and our place in it. Thanks to the collective contributions, Canada's receiving a share of Webb's observation time, and this is what moves me so much, to see young researchers excited about what this means for them, their careers, and then what they can contribute. Canadian scientists are among the first to study data collected by this telescope. And during the first few years of the mission, the Canadian web science team will be able to use up to 450 hours of guaranteed observing time with the Canadian nearest instrument and Webb's other instruments. After that, Canadian researchers will have access to 5% of the general observation time throughout Webb's lifetime. We're especially pleased by the excellent scientific leadership shown by young Canadian astronomers who will be leading projects during the first cycle of observation. So as you said, Thomas, this was conceived of by people before we started our jobs, and now, le flambeau est pris par d'autres qui vont l'emmener vers le futur. So this interest from the next generation shows the vibrancy of our community. Our young astronomers now have a chance to solve cosmic mysteries and make incredible discoveries that were unthinkable only a few years ago. Merci. Merci, Lisa. <clears throat> Merci, and we will uh, we will hear from the uh, from the scientists who will share share some of the uh, uh, details, uh, uh, scientific uh, uh, first uh, uh, works um, in the second part of this panel. Joseph, um, 
you were less than a year uh, in, as, uh, as a, in, your, in your current position when uh, James Webb was launched. So I guess it was a very special experience uh, to, uh, to have uh, such a program and this upcoming milestone on your desk as you're starting uh, your new mandate. So how, uh, how did you manage that? How did you live personally this experience and how complex was that? No, thank you, uh, Steve. I mean, absolutely. I was actually just uh, being DG or nominated DG of ESA, and a couple of uh, really weeks afterwards, I was immediately told by my team, look, there's a, a major event coming towards the end of the year, uh, the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. We need to prepare well, and we need to, be, to make sure that this is all going flawless. And uh, of course, immediately I called my science teams and my launcher directorate uh, together and see what uh, is at stake uh, and what needs to be done. And uh, I have to admit, I was actually learning myself about the wonders of this uh, James Webb Space telescope while I got into the job and I was I got the science explained by Günther Hasinger, uh, director of science. I got the launcher uh, complexity and the challenges explained by Daniel Neuenschwander uh, and I realized that this is just a big job uh, that is coming up uh, towards the end of the year. Of course immediately I instructed my teams to do everything everything necessary that uh, this goes well and that this is uh, a glamorous moment for NASA, uh, for Canada, for us and for all uh, participants. In fact, also on the European side, we really teamed up uh, with uh, Ariane Spass, uh, with uh, our colleagues on the launcher uh, side with Ariane Group to make sure that also Team Europe is very strong and is united and is well coordinated uh, in all the, the things that have to be done. So yes, this was a, a huge moment and you see here uh, really the keyword is partnership, uh, with, uh, which uh, I think is, uh, is what characterizes this, uh, this achievement of the James Webb Sp uh, Space Telescope. You see here the, the main uh, logos of uh, the space agencies involved. Of course, um, uh, with the help of our uh, colleagues from the launchers, we made this uh, possible. But this really has been work in progress for decades. I have not done myself much uh, to contribute to this, apart from the last couple of months uh, before the launch. But this is really all the credit goes to the science teams, to the engineering teams, to NASA, particularly really to Thomas, who had, who had a hard time to, to get it uh, to the launch pad. Um, and uh, uh, many of you know very well the industrial challenges he had to face and he had to make sure that the project is, uh, is going well and is, uh, is concluded on time um, in order to, to really have this launch and uh, really thank you from my side as being one of these partners in this undertaking. Let me just show you maybe the next slide which uh, also has uh, these are contribution highlighted of uh, what we are contributing to it. Of course, the launch uh, being the highlight on Christmas Day and everyone would remember this, uh, this moment. But also we have been uh, contributing uh, one and a half instruments out of the four, the NIRSPEC uh, instrument uh, was developed through an ESA framework, of course, always uh, with our member states, and about half of the MIRI uh, instrument uh, together with the other half uh, through, through NASA. Uh, we also have a science team uh, in Europe uh, and also some colleagues in the US who are working actively in the definition of the science and now, of course, in the, in the use of these data. Lisa was highlighting the, the excitement of these science teams. I've met some of them and I can tell you they're really thrilled and we are actively participating in the, in the scientific use of these data. We have seen some first images and some glimpses of what is about, about to come, but uh, what we will see uh, in the next uh, years, literally, or decades even, will be just uh, stunning and eye-opening, thanks to really this uh, marvelous piece of technology. Of course, Christmas Day was a special day uh, when uh, the launch took place and uh, we saw that it was successful and you saw this image on the right-hand side of, uh, of uh, this slide when uh, the James Webb Space Telescope separated successfully from, from the launcher. We gave our interviews and I still remember that uh, I've said that this is a gift to humanity because uh, we help humanity understand where we come from, where the universe comes from and also how it develops. And I think this literally is what it was on Christmas Day. And I'm very proud to be part of this huge team, a fantastic team that has made this possible. Thank you. Um, Very quickly, in a few words, what makes uh, ESA is, is, is an agency which is born on international collaboration. Uh, what makes this program different in terms of international collaboration in, in a few words? Yeah. Now, very briefly, I mean, we have, of course, many uh, projects of international cooperation, the ISS and many, many other activities, Artemis, of course, right now. I think in this particular case, we do see how this really 
touches every angle of society. You have seen the images, the first images of the James Webb Space Telescope everywhere uh, in all uh, angles uh, by so many people in all the countries. And I think the widespread and the, the, the penetration of this science into, um, into all levels of society, into all countries, the excitement that it has created is, is quite unique. And I think this is something that uh, we are all very, very happy to see. Okay, okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Joseph. Uh, Stéphane, um, launching James Webb um, has been a historical milestone uh, for Iron Space. Uh, it was obviously as well a, a major respons uh, responsibility on your rocket shoulder. Um, how does it feel? He's arriving. Yeah. <laughs> how does it feel to have uh, such a passenger on your on your rocket on the Christmas Day? You, you will see some uh, images uh, from the arrival of the telescope by boat. Uh, usually, uh, our classical satellites, they come by uh, an Antonov, but here it was by boat. And you, you will see uh, during my speech uh, some images of this uh, amazing campaign. Um, maybe just um, a few milestones. So uh, the discussions on web started uh, at the end of uh, the 1990s. In, 2000, in 2003, we made the first preliminary studies. In 2015, this was uh, this, uh, the formal award of the contract. And then uh, the pressure becomes higher and higher. Um, very important milestone. Uh, um, summer, six months before the launch, Thomas uh, called me and said me, yes, I would like to come to Guyana. Ah, OK, uh, bon, why not? And it was the start of the final countdown. And Thomas came for the launch before Webb. And it was very important because at this period of time, we have had to requalify uh, the fairing. And you see the fairing on the images. So it was quite uh, sensitive. And by the way, what you see, the encapsulation has not been an easy one. And so I can really say that uh, for me, the final countdown started six months before, which is more than what we do usually. And uh, I would highlight towards uh, team spirit, because we have really worked uh, as a team, bon, Iron Space and Iron Group for sure, but uh, NASA, uh, ESA, and, uh, and Iron Space, and transparency. And Hervé uh, could say more on that, but we have given all the information we could give to NASA uh, in the last uh, four or five years, because uh, we have had to mitigate some uh, limited issues on Ariane, and it was very important to give all the information to NASA. And you know, this campaign has been very special because um, at the end of the day, what was very important was the level of cleanliness, and it has uh, imposed very special protocols. And uh, uh, here again, it was a full transparency. For Ariane Space and for the Ariane family, um, but failure was not an option. Mm. And uh, it was uh, for us absolutely mandatory to be uh, successful. And we have been even over successful with uh, uh, the perfect injection uh, and the overachievement of the injection. But uh, it's clear that what is a bit difficult to, to manage is, um, I mean, when you have a $10 billion bird and that failure is not an option. And then, <laughs> Many things happen in your head, even if you are totally confident in the rocket, and we were sure that we have done all we could. Uh, it puts a, a little of pressure, but it was a, a positive pressure because we had uh, this uh, team spirit. And I think this is really what matters, team and trust. When you have such a difficult project to handle, this, makes, uh, this really makes uh, the difference. I just remember the, the day of the launch, we were on the launch pad with Thomas, Joseph, Philippe Baptiste from CNES. And Thomas wanted to have people from Netflix with us. So it was an idea of Thomas, and it was a good idea. And then the guy said, uh, OK, I have a question for the four of you. Uh, what is happening if there is an anomaly? <laughs> when you say an anomaly in your business, it, it means a collapse. <laughs> Um, so we looked at the rocket and we say, uh, no, but you know, bon, space is difficult. It's not always <laughs> successful. So we are all prepared to that. And, but I don't think this was really what we were thinking. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I really remember this discussion. And maybe it would be shared by Netflix because <laughs> it's really collector, as we, say, uh, <laughs> as we say in French. And after the launch, what has happened? Uh, uh, for uh, the people we were in Jupiter Center, we were very happy, but I must say that we all cry. So, you know, mm. it's 
Nah. Pressure release. So now it's done. But you had a good uh, Christmas party. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I guess the Christmas party at the end was, uh, was pretty successful. <laughs> and, and just maybe to finish, the first Ariane was launched 24 December 1979. James was launched 25 December 2021. In our, uh, in our uh, profession, there is a lot of superstitious, and it means that for Ariane, Christmas is a good day. Either 24 or 25, we can launch, so mm. no problem. <laughs> Thank you, Stefan. <laughs> Harvey, <clears throat> we are just a bit uh, over, uh, on, on, uh, over schedule, but it's fine, it's fine. So, um, so you, as a CTO, you have to manage the, the hard points, <laughs> 100 single point of failures uh, potential. Um, how do you manage such a complex program from a technical point of view? Well, uh, apart uh, from the fact that the uh, uh, the payload, as we as we call it in uh, in our uh, activity, uh, was uh, an extraordinary one uh, in terms of uh, value, scientific value, and uh, uh, of course the cost uh, of it, which was putting, uh, as was said by uh, by Joseph and uh, and by Stefan, uh, a kind pressure on us. Uh, it was 35 times uh, the equivalent of 35 launches at once. We we had to do uh, on that uh, on that. Day. So, apart from that kind of pressure, uh, there were many, many little challenges we had to, to overcome to, to prepare the, the flight. And this was all about taking care uh, of the payload, uh, taking care of checking the compatibility, the overall compatibility, the end to end compliance of the launcher with all the requirements uh, of uh, the, the laboratory. Uh, this we started to do in 2015, so over seven years, six years, we, we, we did perform uh, these checks. We were subject to a very kind review in 2019 by uh, NASA people coming to us to check the way we are proceeding to decide to fly uh, and to engage operations and so on. Then this was about taking care uh, of uh, the laboratory uh, in uh, the ground uh, operations, so many uh, challenges such like the cleanliness and together with NASA we worked together with our operators and I must say we learned I think mutually about our ways of proceeding to assure this uh, absolute uh, cleanliness on the, on the lab. Uh, this was about the um, encapsulation of it as was said by, uh, by Stefan. Um, Ariane 5 had been selected uh, almost 20 years ago due to the uh, volume which is available under the fairing. However, the, the baby was a little bit large, <laughs> uh, really large, and we had really to, to be very careful when uh, mating it on the, on the launcher and when encapsulating it uh, under the, the fairing. We had no uh, mechanical margin uh, there. And then this was uh, all about taking care of it in flight. So in flight, uh, of course, we had the challenges with the vibration level on it. We had a huge challenge regarding the depressurization under the fairing. So uh, we created some specific devices to keep uh, the venting valves open during flight to make sure that at the time when the, the fairings would jettison, uh, at that time there would be no depressurization shock within the satellite, not uh, leading to tear uh, the MLI, the multi-layer insulation uh, system uh, on the satellite. So we were very careful on that. We tested it several times on several flights uh, before. Uh, this was about uh, taking care uh, of the payload after releasing it uh, in space, what we uh, just saw here. Uh, so we had uh, in our mission, in our requirements, uh, the requirement to escape from the area where we had released uh, the, uh, the, the laboratory and to make sure, uh, thanks to the very, very residual pressure we had uh, in one of our tanks, to make sure that we would push the, uh, the, the, the upper stage far from an envelope volume uh, that was forbidden uh, to us. So many, many specificities that we had to, to develop, to, to qualify, to test uh, also uh, in flight. And finally, the main challenge was about uh, the precision, the accuracy uh, for the uh, insertion uh, on the orbit. So for this, I will not unveil everything. We, we 
took care to select the best or the most performant of our inertial measurement units, uh, the, the ones we had uh, uh, with us uh, at that time. Uh, we took uh, high care in the way we, 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 we performed, uh, the, we, we developed the, the, the flight software. Uh, one has to, to realize uh, what, what has been done thanks to that. Uh, let's, uh, le let's have in mind that when we launch uh, a payload on the ballistic trajectory, uh, usually we target um, uh, uh, an orbit which is a position in space which is 30 times farther than the trajectory that has been done by the launcher. This time, this was 1,000 times more. So we had to be precise enough to hit a target which was 1,000 times farther, and we just hit the center of it, exactly yeah. the center of it. Really impressive. What I'd really like to do is just, uh, I've not been on stage with Hervé since, uh, since launch. I just want to make sure that everybody understands that Hervé and his team personally added a factor of two of observation time because of the excellence of that maneuver. So I really applause to Hervé. So I think this is a, a great conclusion for this first part. Unfortunately, we, we could uh, talk for another 30 minutes or an hour, but unfortunately, we have, uh, we, we have to move on on our agenda. Please stay seated. We are going to move to part two, where with the lead scientist uh, presenting some early results. So please stay seated. But please join me to applause our, our gentleman here. And, and thank you very much. Merci à vous. Merci. Merci. And I'm calling uh, the other uh, the panelists uh, to, to join me for part two. Eric, Pascal. Oh, good. That was a swift transition. Um, welcome uh, to this uh, panel on James Webb. Um, now we have a video. Yeah, maybe we can we can sw switch the video. Um, welcome for this uh, part two um, on uh, James Webb. Um, and uh, during this second part, we have the pleasure to have lead scientists who are working um, on the scientific exploitation of uh, of the telescope, and uh, they are going to share uh, some of the early science results uh, from James Webb. Um, presenting our panelists, so starting on my on my right, we have uh, Eric Smith, uh, program scientist for the uh, James Webb Space telescope program, astrophysics Div division chief scientist at NASA. Then on his left, uh, Dr. Pascal Tremblin, researcher at the CEA at Paris-Saclay. Vasilis Charmandaris, director and researcher at the Institute of Astrophysics, professor of Department of Physics, University of Crete. And Guido Roberts Borsani, postdoctoral researcher, University of California at UCLA. So it's going to be great because we're going to, to discuss uh, uh, science, even if I'm absolutely not scientific myself, but as a scientist myself. But I'd like to, so I'd like to, st uh, to start, Eric, by asking you a question from a non-scientist point of view. Um, very simple question. Uh, what makes James Webb special compared to all other telescopes and all the tools that you had at your disposal before? What can you do today that you could not do before, basically? Uh, that's actually a great question. And it, uh, Webb's main benefit is the giant size of its mirror. It, uh, we have never launched a telescope this large into space. So this light collecting capability far exceeds anything we've had before. In fact, it's a, more than 100 times more powerful than the Hubble Space Telescope. So the combination of giant mirror and cold telescope let us see things we could never have seen without this telescope. I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything about that. Any, uh, yeah? I don't know if you want to share, I don't know. That's, why, make, uh, why is, that, is that tool so powerful compared to others? In, in addition to what Eric mentioned, the great advantage also is that it offers us observations in wavelengths that we couldn't see with our eyes. And we are able to peer through the dust and actually see the most interesting parts of the universe which are actually hidden from our mm. eyes. Okay, interesting. 
Eric, uh, I think you're going to present some uh, uh, highlights on the same program that will be coming from uh, Web's uh, first uh, year of, uh, of operations uh, and observations. I, I, I let you commenting uh, sure. these beautiful uh, images behind yeah. us. Sure. Uh, what I want to talk about are some of the first science results. Now, the picture you see uh, behind us here was uh, from one of the handful of results we put out just to verify that the telescope would work. I like to think of this as what Webb can do when it's not even trying. It was the deepest picture of the universe ever taken. But we wanted to have programs that exercised all the telescope's capabilities the way scientists would. So we constructed what we called the Early Release Science Program. And that was 13 programs we selected, uh, three of which you'll hear represented today. And I wanted to talk uh, just a little bit about some of the other science that uh, you won't hear about, but was uh, conducted in this Early Release Science Program. This image here, it's of a type of star we call a wolf Rye star. It's a very hot star star nearing the end of its life. It will eventually supernovae, and those ripples you see are actually pieces of the star that have been ejected in pulses, and this is how dust is distributed in the universe. The stars make it, they send it out, and those giant clouds that were in the Carina Nebula that Thomas showed, those are formed in stars just like this. And so this is a beautiful image, and this and another image have something in common that I want to uh, highlight. So this is one of the early release science programs. This is not an early release science program. This is of the M74, a beautiful face-on spiral galaxy as seen by Webb. And the two last two images you saw were not produced in that form by NASA or by scientists. They were produced by the public. This is really science and space for all. All these data are public. Anyone in this room can download them, use them for science if they wish, or for art if they wish. Both of those images were produced by lay people, and I think that's just astounding. So, Just one question. Uh, how much time does it take to process the data? When you receive the data from the telescope, uh, how, what's the, uh, the, the, the complexity, the processing? Uh, to, to, make, to become an image. The, uh, there is a, a pipeline of processes that occur once the data come down to put them in some basic format for use later on. Uh, so that takes just a few hours for that process. To produce an image like you see behind me can take many hours to days, depending upon how you want to manipulate it's them and what you want to do them. It's pretty uh, quick. Yeah. Yeah, pretty quick. <laughs> Uh, so I'll just say very quickly before, we, uh, before I pass it on to Pascal that this early release science program investigates all types of astronomy from the images of Jupiter that you saw there. We've taken pictures of exoplanets. Uh, we'll be looking at supermassive stars and how they form ice that forms around stellar systems, how stars die like that wolf Rye star, and how galaxies become active in their centers and eventually disrupt the galaxy uh, around them and the deep uh, images we'll see from the universe. So we're doing all of that, but I really want to turn it over to these folks so they can tell you in detail about the amazing stuff they're doing and releasing to the public immediately. Pascal, so uh, you're going to show us some early release on the area of exoplanets. Yes, exactly. So I'm going to present some uh, early release uh, science results from the uh, Exoplanet uh, Transmission Spectroscopy Program. So on behalf of uh, Dr. Nathalie Batala uh, from the University of Santa Cruz, that is, uh, who is copy of the program, but unfortunately could not join us today. Uh, so for exoplanets, actually, we are, uh, to date we have observed thousands of uh, exoplanets orbiting other stars across the galaxy. And most of these detections have been done using the transit method. So with the transit method, what we do is that we observe the light of a star as a function of time. And when the planet is passing in front of uh, the star, it's going to, blood, to block some of the starlight, causing a dimming of the light curve. It's what we call a transit. And uh, so the transit method is used by uh, space missions like NASA's uh, Kepler and TESS mission. But these missions are observing the uh, transit in uh, uh, effectively white light. GWST is observing also transit, but is uh, equipped with a special purpose spectrometer that allow us to observe a transit in many, many colors uh, at the same time. 
here is an, uh, an example that actually the, we cannot really see uh, the, the, the curve. So normally you see the transit in uh, uh, many different colors of, uh, observed by uh, GWST on uh, July 10th. So it's uh, the transit of the exoplanet WASP-39b. So WASP-39b is a hot gas giant orbiting a sun-like star at uh, roughly uh, 700 light years away in the constellation of Virgo. And the planet is orbiting very close actually to this host star, uh, 120th of the distance between the Earth and the Sun. It's uh, orbiting, it's completing one orbit in roughly four Earth days, so it's very fast. And uh, uh, normally what you, uh, you should have seen on this picture uh, is uh, uh, the transit in many, many different colors uh, uh, quantified by the wavelength, so it's a number uh, that you can see. And uh, actually there is uh, uh, not much information uh, in, uh, in this slide anyway because uh, when you look at the light curve, uh, the transit looks roughly the same in all the colors. But what is important is that it's not exactly the same. And this is because Uh, uh, planets have atmospheres, and here is shown by uh, the, uh, um, the semi-transparent uh, shaded halo uh, around the planet. And uh, when the planet is eclipsing its host stars, uh, uh, the starlight is uh, filtering uh, through the atmosphere, and the molecules in the atmosphere are going to leave uh, to impart a, a chemical fingerprint uh, on the light. And those chemical uh, fingerprints are going to uh, change the, uh, the form of the transit in very subtle ways. So when uh, a planet is blocking uh, the light of the, the star, the molecules uh, in the atmosphere are going to block more or less light at uh, different colors. So here is an example of the transits in three uh, different colors, uh, represented by the uh, blue, green, and red dots. And when you can directly see that the green dots are uh, lower than the red dots. And this means that the planet is blocking more starlight at a wavelength of 4.3 micron than it does at 4.7. And actually what's happening is that in the atmosphere there is the CO2 molecule that is absorbing preferentially the starlight at a wavelength, uh, at a wavelength of uh, 4.3 micron. <coughs> so here on this plot, Uh, uh, we are, uh, all the dots are uh, representing the starlight that is blocked at different colors. Uh, this is what we call the transmission spectrum. And you can uh, really see on this plot the variation as a function of wavelength. And you can see the bump at 4.3 microns, so it's the green dots in the previous slide. And this is actually the CO2 molecule, so carbon dioxide, that is uh, uh, absorbing and causing this bump uh, in the transmission spectrum. And GWST uh, gave us, uh, for the first time, the unequivocal uh, detection of the CO2 molecule uh, in the atmosphere of an exoplanet. And uh, what's amazing about uh, James Webb is that it's going to, uh, uh, this is really opening the path to the detection of CO2 and many, many other molecules uh, in the atmosphere of uh, many exoplanets across the galaxy. Why is uh, CO2 um, uh, that important? What does it tell us on a planet? So uh, what's really important for, uh, for CO2 in this planet is that uh, uh, we can use it to uh, determine what we call the metallicity of the planet. So it's the amount of uh, atoms other than hydrogen and helium. And the metallicity of the planet uh, tells us information about the formation process. So we try to infer where the planet has formed in the protoplanetary disk, how it has migrated in time, uh, so that we observe it as it is today. So it's a complicated process that takes uh, a long time because the planet is old, is a billion years old. Uh, but uh, this type of information can tell us, uh, uh, give us some clues about what's, uh, what happened during that time. And if I understood correctly, you were able to do this for a giant planet, but do you expect that you will be able to do this for smaller planets as well? So uh, we want to do it for sure, but it's... What, what is the complexity on, uh, in... in the signal at, uh, are uh, much more difficult to, uh, mm. to, to catch compared to the noise. Uh, so it's, uh, it's very difficult to detect the, this type of signal on, uh, on uh, rocky planets. Uh, but uh, we, this is definitely we're trying to, uh, this is definitely something we're going to, to try to do for two types of targets, I would say. So the, the, the rocky planets that are very close, that we think are lava planets. So it's uh, really interesting because they're so hot that the surface should probably be a, a lava planet like uh, in uh, uh, the planet in the Star Wars movies uh, where... Uh, <laughs> 
And, uh, Put the microphone. Yes, sorry. And uh, the others are the planets that are in the habitable zone, where we, uh, we are supposed to be able to have uh, water, uh, liquid water at the surface. So we want to know uh, the molecules that uh, are in the atmosphere to be able to constrain what's happening in terms of water cycle and possibly uh, biological. Uh, uh. Impressive. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Pascal. Um, yes, indeed. So Vasilis, uh, can you uh, provide us as well uh, an overview of, uh, of your research in, in your field of, uh, of area? Definitely, it's a pleasure. Since we are representing the scientific community, I would like to thank on behalf of all of us, first of all, the funding agencies and their industrial partners who actually made this wonderful present to us. Well, near, a couple of days after the longest night of the year in the Northern Hemisphere, they launched JWST, and it's fantastic, and it's been a pleasure. Uh, because, you know, scientists are often very demanding, but uh, because they yes. only need data, and often they forget about how complicated truth, it is to actually make <clears throat> things happen. So, how did you feel, just one question, how did you feel, uh, because we were thinking, how did you feel when you saw the first image? Was it like more than you were expecting when you saw the image? You said, wow, that is even more, or is it is... Uh, I, I, actually, I was uh, extremely impressed because I had the privilege to be involved in two previous missions, one led by ESA, the Infrared Space Observatory, and then uh, Spitzer Space Telescope by NASA. So I knew already how challenging it is to actually make the launch happen and ensure that everything works smoothly. And the engineers and the funding agencies who are behind mm. are really the people who, that should be get all the credit. Here, uh, what I'm <coughs> presenting is another example of a really a long collaboration, a long-standing collaboration by people, scientists in seven countries and 19 institutions, where they actually show, I will show you images of a couple of galaxies with cryptic, cryptic names, galaxies that are interacting with themselves. The gravity that holds all of, all of us in our chairs makes stars in those galaxies come nearby. And here you see an image of one of these systems. It has the name VV114. And up until the launch of JWST, what we could see, we could see only the component on the right, the galaxy on the right. The galaxy on the left was not really visible. But thanks to JWST, you can actually see now clearly that uh, the left galaxy is easily seen. And everything that you see in red are actually regions that are, even in the JWST light, are covered by dust. So all light rather than the longer wavelengths is absorbed. The same way when we see the sun just before sunset that appears red, just because only the red light of the rainbow goes through the dust. So this is a spectacular image of this galaxy. And we are able to resolve the eastern component of the system. And uh, we can actually do even better. We can zoom in in that area, you can see, and you can actually see clearly the composition of the system. And we can actually reveal to us for the first, the community for the first time, that this galaxy, this eastern component that we couldn't see before, is very likely, very likely host a supermassive black hole which accretes gas, but uh, we cannot really see it vividly just because it has a large quantity of the dust on top of it. And if we overexpose the same image, you can actually see it here, uh, both nuclei are saturated now. You can see easily those red dots all the way around, which are clusters of stars embedded into dust again. And you can even see small galaxies further in the background, so that even though we have this couple of systems along our line of sight, the JWST is so powerful that you can see through that and look at small galaxies in the background. And this system is particularly interesting just because this type of galaxies that we will hear by Guido later on are typical, even though they are rare in the local universe, are typically a, a dominant population in the high relative universe. And uh, it's very important with JWST to understand how, what happens locally to actually uh, get a better physical sense of what happens in the past. And the second galaxy, its name is even more peculiar, Tuzuiki 96. Uh, this peculiar system, which is again disturbed due to the f influence of gravity, uh, the uniqueness is, was that unlike seeing the most energy to be coming from the nuclei, it came from a fuzzy region that you see over there in between the nuclei. We couldn't really resolve what was happening up until the launch of James Webb. 
And thanks to James Webb, we can look very closely into that region. You can actually clearly see what happens. You can actually resolve this uh, extra nuclear massive uh, region which emits most of the power of this galaxy in the infrared wavelengths. And we all look forward to additional observations that we will take down the road using the spectroscopic infrared uh, the spe uh, internal in integral field units. And I'm sure there will be more surprises mm. coming down the road. As, as, you know, as the ancient Greeks actually said, if you are not prepared for the unexpected, you'll never discover it. So <laughs> we are prepared for the unexpected, and we thank again the engineers for making this possible. Amazing, amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Rasis. <clears throat> Just quickly, what is your next uh, priority area of research uh, from that? What's yeah. next? Uh, the, our next priority is actually to do spectroscopic observation on these galaxies because this will give us direct information on the chemical composition that we heard earlier on and also the intensity of the radiation field, the processes that actually excite the molecules. Is it uh, events which are associated with accretion onto a supermassive black hole or is it just huge number of very massive stars that are producing all the light? Fantastic. Uh, Guido, uh, can you provide an overview as well on your on your research um, and share some uh, some insights? Yeah, so I work on ultra distant galaxies with uh, JWST, and despite JWST giving us data for only two months or so, uh, those first data have already revolutionised our understanding of uh, early galaxies, the most distant galaxies in the universe. The reason for that is because the universe is expanding, it means most of the light that comes from uh, distant galaxies is emitted in the infrared. Uh, and so up until now, uh, we didn't really have the capabilities to uh, confirm the distances to these very distant galaxies or even obtain anything about their properties. We knew nothing about their underlying physics. So the arrival of uh, JWST really heralds a new dawn and quite literally gives us a new pair of eyes with which to uh, study the initial conditions uh, of the universe and, and get finally these distances and properties of, of the galaxies. And GLASS JWST, which is one of the ERS programs which we're leading at UCLA, <clears throat> really gives us a unique new window uh, into studying galaxy evolution. Uh, and in these next few minutes, I hope to show you exactly how. So on the left uh, image, what you can see is uh, an image of a, a, a cluster, a massive cluster of nearby galaxies as seen by the Hubble Space Telescope with its Frontier Fields program. And what immediately sticks out is the really large variety and diversity of these thousands of galaxies in, the, in that image. What you can see already are spiral galaxies, elliptical galaxies, merging galaxies, galaxies with supermassive black holes or that are having their gas ripped out of them. And crucially, what you can also see, if you squint really, really hard, are some of the most distant galaxies that we can see, uh, that we know of, some 13.5 billion light years uh, away from us. Um, and Hubble has imaged this uh, extensively, but these galaxies are so far away that normally we wouldn't actually see them with our detectors. But fortunately, a cluster like this represents nature's magnifying glass. And what I mean by that is it showcases a phenomena called gravitational lensing. And that's what you can see on the right image over there. If you have uh, a background galaxy that's very far away, you have a foreground uh, set of cluster galaxies that are nearby, the extreme gravitational field uh, from these nearby cluster galaxies bends the light from uh, these distant galaxies so that that light falls onto the line of sight and reaches our detectors. And so these distant galaxies appear brighter uh, and larger than they ordinarily would be. And that allows us to detect them. So yeah, Hubble has imaged these uh, extensively, but imaging alone uh, is not sufficient to uh, confirm the distances of these suspected distant galaxies and reveal the physics of the gas and the stars within them. What we need for that are spectra. So of course, spectra is the splitting uh, of white light into its constituent uh, wavelengths or energies. And when we look at spectra, we can see the chemical imprint from gas and stars on that. And it's those signatures that we look for uh, to, to confirm the distances of these, uh, these suspected 
distant galaxies and understand uh, their physics. And so that's what we aim to do with the GLASS JWST survey. We use James Webb uh, now to take spectra with the nearest instrument over the central cluster, as well as near spec, so two different infrared images, uh, or instruments rather. Uh, and with near cam, we image a completely blank new patch of the sky in parallel. And so in mid-July, we were all anticipating the data, and they finally arrived, and they were just exquisite. Uh, and so what I'm showing you is the raw data from this program. It's the deepest of the extragalactic ERS programs. On the left, what you can see is this dispersion of the light of thousands of galaxies within that cluster. So now for every single galaxy within that field of view, and remember there are thousands of them, we are getting a spectrum where we can confirm the distances, we can establish what their chemical composition is, and we can determine the ages of the stars within them. On the right, you're seeing uh, the two parallel uh, near cam images. So this is, these are combined uh, filter images. There are, the, the images were taken through seven different filters, uh, which are listed there in the top right. The nearest uh, data were taken with three different uh, filters. So this covers really a large range of infrared wavelengths. And within the first two weeks, we scoured through this data looking for ultra-distant galaxies, trying to confirm their natures, and we found four different ones. So you're looking at real data over here that have been used for publications. On the left, I'll draw your attention to the, the dark blue images. These are the dispersed light within which you can see the signatures of gas uh, and of the stars. And if you project this into 1D, which are those sort of curves below, you can see this sort of drop in light uh, in the leftmost panel. And this gives us the precise distance of these galaxies. So these galaxies formed only 600 million years after the Big Bang. Um, so really, really some of the very first galaxies we know of. And on the right, what you can see uh, is uh, two different galaxies. Each uh, row represents a different galaxy imaged in the different filters. And you can see that some of these appear to drop out of some of these filters. These are infrared filters going from blue to red, left to right. And this characteristic dropout signature tells us that the galaxies formed only 400 million years after the Big Bang. So within the first two weeks, we found some of the most distant galaxies known to date. Imagine what we can do in a year's time. Thank you, Guido. That's impressive. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are uh, reaching close to the end of the panel. I just have uh, a few quick questions. Um, we've heard since the beginning, James Webb is a lot about international cooperation for the implementation of the program and to the exploitation of the data. From a scientific point of view, how do you for formalize this international partnership between scientists? Maybe starting with you, Eric. So uh, science by its very nature is international, and these collaborations form through people you meet as students, people you meet at meetings, people you meet at conferences just like this. Uh, so to have an international mission for scientists, it's just how we do business. Can you explain how you work uh, internationally with, with your counterparts? And, uh, Astronomers have the privilege to travel a lot, to study or to work. So. You know, I had the privilege to spend time in the U.S. and be educated there. Mm -hmm. Spend a lot of my formative experience here in the Paris area, which was also spectacular at the uh, CEA. So via this uh, process, you actually meet people. And science is a collaborative effort. That is, you, you have a common goal, try to solve a problem, a question that puzzles you, and then... Uh, and is it an accelerator in terms of scientific partnerships? Do you feel that it's going to accelerate uh, joint programs and joint research. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely, because the differing viewpoints that the different people, different uh, experience base, different cultures bring new insights to all these investigations and we see missions. So I think it's essential. I don't, I don't know about the rest of you. Absolutely. I mean, no one person has all of the expertise to you know, make all of these images science ready, analyze them, understand the implications of what we're seeing. So you've got to reach out to your collaborators to prepare the data, analyze them. Uh, you know, in the GLASS survey, we have people all across the US. We have people in Europe, uh, in Australia as well. So, you know, the most challenging part of our job now becomes finding a communal uh, time for Zoom calls rather than analyzing the data. <laughs> 
Ah, yeah, and sometimes it's, uh, uh, the data are quite difficult to analyze, so to be able to uh, confront our different ways to, to deal with the data, the different models that we are using, we can make sure that uh, uh, the, the, the science that we get out of that is actually robust. So it's also great to be able to collaborate internationally and uh, to put all uh, our efforts into understanding uh, truly what we can do with uh, James Webb. Very quickly, just uh, uh, again, uh, like uh, maybe a naive question, but who decides where uh, web is going to look at? Who is deciding the, the, uh, the shots, basically? So once a year, we put out a call for ideas. What should web look at for next year? Uh, thousands of scientists submit proposals, usually large teams. So literally, the first year, there were some 4,000 scientists involved. And then those proposals come in, and other scientists then look at them and determine which ideas are most exciting to them. So a peer review process decides what will web look at over the course of the next year. Okay. That's clear. Time for conclusion. Um, just going to ask you uh, to put yourself in the future. Um, we are around, let's say, 2000, uh, 2050, 2050, and you're looking backwards. Okay. So, what has been at, the, at this point of the time? Uh, what has been, from your point of view, the key scientific discovery, if you have to say one, enabled by James Webb, or what has been his most impressive contribution to science, and each of you? Okay, well, I'm lucky I get to go first here. Uh, I think the most amazing uh, knowledge that will come is when we go out and look up at the night sky to be able to point to several locations across the night sky where habitable worlds exist. And that will be the first time in humanity's history that we could say life could be there, could be there, could be there. Nice. So, yeah. That's <laughs> good. So yeah, we we'll follow up on that from the exoplanet perspective, and also uh, it will be the discovery of uh, all the molecules that are uh, around there, and uh, that actually we do not see in our solar system, so very different worlds, uh, as I said, lava worlds with uh, very complex ke uh, chemical cycles that we actually do not expect at all. Merci, uh, even though I think I will agree with Eric, but I think the most powerful message that can come out is that via this wonderful machine, humanity can demonstrate that this, the universe is predictable. Physics works. We make an experiment, we test the theory, we make another experiment, we push the frontier. I think that unique opportunity that we have, thanks to the technological advances, is something that will make us as humanity better and more proud down the road. Oh, that's great. And Guido, last word, last word. I'll, I'll answer from the other end of the universe, uh, but I would love to see the detection of the very first generation of stars and see how the emergence of the first galaxies correlates with the presence of dark matter, for instance. But what I would love to see as well is, is something new. Every time, history tells us every time we have a new billion dollar telescope, something unexpected happens. And I think I'm looking forward to the unknown. Let's put it that way. Okay. So same time, same, same time, same place in 2050 to check, uh, to check backwards. Um, before that, uh, this afternoon, uh, just as, uh, before we close, uh, uh, please join uh, uh, room N02. There will be a, a web briefing, uh, public briefing. You, uh, there will be exclusive images released at that time. Uh, there's going as well the ability to, to, uh, to ask questions and so on. So uh, please join this web briefing at 2 p.m. Uh, meanwhile, uh, it was really exciting, uh, really super panel and super session. Thank you very much for all the panelists for sharing these incredible insights and have a good day. Cheers.